Our last talk of a session is by Aaron about to, uh, a comprehensive understanding of Russia's transit censorship. Aaron, the floor is yours. I'm Aaron from the University of Maryland, and I'm presenting uh, preliminary work on transit censorship by Russian internet service providers. So transit censorship refers to the application of censorship policies, not only to uh, packets destined uh, for one's own country, but also for packets that simply transit the country on their way to the destination. In other words, network communications from one country to another are subject to censorship by a third country on the path between them. Previous work considers collateral, uh, transit censorship to be under the umbrella of collateral damage because it results in ostensibly unintentional overblocking of users outside of the, the country where censorship uh, policies are deployed. Uh, but because transit censorship policies can be uh, deployed intentionally, we use the term transit censorship over collateral damage to distinguish between more obviously unintentional forms of overblocking, such as IP-based blocking of CDN servers or relaxed regular expressions um, that match more websites than the blocking target. So previous work has noticed Russian transit censorship. Um, Vimpelcom, the second largest telecommunications operator in Russia, has been discovered to block transit traffic from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, and similarly, uh, Megaphone, the third largest telecoms operator in Russia, as well as the ISP, Gavant Telecom, uh, have been found to block transit traffic uh, destined to Kazakhstan. However, um, kind of these observations of Transit censorship have been um, cursory. There is yet to be a full study of transit censorship um, by Russia. So there are two reasons that we believe that trans transit censorship might be uh, more extensive than previously reported. First, uh, Russia's transit censorship, censorship over the past decade has been aggressive and occasionally haphazard. Uh, attempts to block uh, Telegram via IP-based blocking of millions of IP addresses belonging to uh, Amazon and Google's cloud hosting platforms, uh, of course, eliminated access to several unrelated websites. Similarly, Russia has mistakenly throttled several domains containing the string p.co uh, in an attempt to uh, throttle Twitter's link shortener domain. Second, the centralization of the internet and Russia's censorship infrastructure in general uh, provides the opportunity for significant transit censorship. First, many internet routes to popular websites transit Russia uh, over kind of one-tenth. Um, and secondly, some internet service providers in Russia rely on an upstream provider to perform censorship. So if these upstream providers are not serving end users, they might also be responsible for routing transit traffic. So one of the challenges with measuring censorship in Russia, transit or otherwise, is dealing with Russia's decentralized censorship model uh, due to diversity of blocking mechanisms, targets, and efficacies. Um, so in contrast to a centralized model where all traffic passes through a small set of network choke points, Russia has a decentralized model um, where legal institutions dictate which internet resources should be blocked and when, uh, and it's up to the internet service providers to implement the technical blocking mechanisms. And as a result, internet service providers choose different blocking mechanisms, and some adhere to the national block list more strictly than others. Um, so in order to kind of deal with the uh, diversity of, of blocking mechanisms, uh, one way to kind of simplify the measurement of transit censorship is to kind of request a domain uh, that will be censored everywhere in a, in a similar way. So we assume that transit censorship in Russia, uh, a domain that censors a lot of, a domain that triggers a lot of censorship in Russia uh, is also likely to trigger a lot of transit censors um, and further assuming that transit censors apply the same policies to transit traffic as they do to traffic destined uh, to Russia or originating from Russia. So we use ZGrab to send the TCP three-way handshake as well as an HTTP request for forbidden domains um, to the entire Russian IP space. And what we found is that requests destined for uh, over 900 Russian ISs using the domain facebook.com 
a list of block page response, so we elect to use that in our uh, transit censorship measurements. Uh, we then scan for transit censorship by using the technique introduced by Saudi in the previous presentation, uh, where we send a sin immediately followed by a push act with facebook.com. Um, and to recap, sensors kind of expect to miss some packets due to factors such as load balancing and asymmetric routing, uh, so they may block traffic uh, even if there is no ongoing connection. Um, we, we scanned 18 countries, uh, neighboring uh, Russia, uh, their, their IP allegations, and um, used the uh, ZMAP results to uh, determine blocking. So it's not enough to identify that we got censored. Uh, to fully understand transit censorship, we want to can understand where censorship is occurring. Um, so we send TTL limited uh, SYNAC uh, packet sequences, uh, incrementing the TTL value until we receive uh, blocking uh, from, from Russian sensors. Um, we also limited kind of the, the responses that we're looking at to block page responses since these are very easily um, identifiable or attributable to blocking by Russian ISPs. Um, block pages are, are typically very transparent in, the, in that they identify the blocking party or cite federal law as the, the reason for blocking. So after sending kind of the, the SYNAC packets and identifying um, the hop where censorship occurs, we compare that against trace routes to the same destination. Um, if we can identify the IP address at the hop where censorship is occurring, uh, we look up the AS value of that IP address. However, there's some practical complications towards this kind of methodology. Uh, first is that there may be routing differences uh, between the route taken by traceroute and the route taken by our uh packet sequences. So if we kind of assume that the SYNAC packets uh, take the route highlighted in red while the trace route takes the route highlighted in blue. Um, our SYNAC packets will identify the sensor being at the second hop while the trace route, um, the second hop is a, a router on the path. It's not actually the sensor. Secondly, a lot of sensoring, uh, transit sensoring middle boxes uh, will copy the TTL of the forbidden packet into their injected response. So, Sending a TTL with an initial, sending a packet with an initial TTL with a value of four is sufficient to reach the sensor, uh, but the TTL will have been reduced to a value of one, uh, so the injected response will be uh, dropped by the, the first router hop on the way back. So the minimum TTL value in order for the client to re receive the block page needs to be approximately at least twice the, the hop distance to the sensor, um, although in cases of asymmetric routing, where the path to the sensor differs from the, the path back from the sensor, um, it's not as simple as dividing uh, the minimum TTL value that triggers censorship by two. Um, in this case, if the trace route and the SYNAC packets both take uh, the blue route and the path back always takes the, the red route, um, it'll take five hops for the packet or a, a, initial TTL of five for the packet uh, to go to the sensor via the blue route and come back to the client, and dividing by two, depending on rounding, will get you the second or third hop, neither of which are the sensor. Um, the third kind of issue is with sensors that just don't respond to the trace route, either by uh, not responding to the trace route at all or not decrementing the, the TTL um, before forwarding the packet. And in, both, in one case, um, you'll see that the hop exists, but you won't be able to identify the IP address. In the other case, uh, you won't know that the hop exists at all. So our preference for attribution is to look at the block page contents and URL, and we try to match up kind of the ISP identified in the uh, content or, or URL with an organization uh, that operates in AS. So in this example, the ISP responsible for blocking is Avantel, 
um, which is, operates AS25227, which is on the path to several um, IP addresses in Ukraine. So for our results, we find that nine countries are uh, affected by transit censorship by Russia. Um, they're highlighted in yellow, both on the map and in the text on the, the sides, and the white countries are the additional countries that we scanned but did not see transit censorship for. The countries now in purple are countries that had previously been uh, reported as experiencing Russian transit censorship. Only Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan have been identified in previous studies, while Azerbaijan and Ukraine have been identified in anecdotal user reports. The countries in green um, are countries that only observed um, censorship from a single vantage point, um, whereas the countries in blue were the uh, countries that observed censorship from all three of the vantage points that we used in our study from the United States, um, Tokyo, and Sydney. And the observation that transit censorship differs according to the vantage point uh, raises important implications for censorship evasion and that an organization might want to run their servers somewhere um, less affected by transit censorship or network operators uh, might route traffic around AS is known to perform transit censorship. So we identified seven ASs responsible for transit censorship um, and we kind of see three main takeaways with these results. One, Vimpocom has widespread impact it affected uh, every country where we observed Russian transit censorship, except for Georgia, um, but very few IPs in each country, less than 1,000. Um, and also, we don't observe impact by Vimpocom equally from all three of our vantage points. Um, only the United States vantage point saw uh, transit censorship by Vimpocom in all eight affected countries. The Sydney vantage point saw uh, impact only in Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, and the Tokyo vantage point saw no impact from Vimpocom. Secondly, um, the ISS Miranda Media and Artem Zubkov have concentrated impact, uh, each of, but they affect a single country each, but they affect many IPs. Uh, Miranda Media affecting 16,000 in Ukraine and Artem Zubkov affecting 7,000 in Georgia. Um, we also see this trend across our US and Sydney machines. The Tokyo machine sees lesser impact, but these two ASs still account for um, the most censorship um, from the perspective of that machine. Finally, we see that in terms of both the number of ASs and the number of IPs affected, um, Ukraine is subject to the most transit censorship, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, in addition to Vimpocom and Miranda Media, we see three additional ASs which collectively impact uh, an additional 1,800 IP addresses. And we were unable to identify the AS, but our Tokyo machine only uh, impacts an additional 300 um, IP addresses. So in summary, we find that over seven Russian ISs are responsible uh, for transit censorship affecting at least nine countries. We emphasize that this is a lower bound of Russian transit censorship for two reasons. Uh, one, we limit ourselves to only looking at HTTP um, block page censorship as opposed to, to any other kinds. And two, we only use three vantage points which might have low coverage of uh, Russian transit networks. So. Before I open the questions, I just kind of wanted to share the open questions that we're currently looking at as we uh, look to extend this work. One being, how does this look uh, on a global scale? Who's responsible for transit censorship uh, of who? And secondly, how can we use AS topology data uh, to more intelligently select vantage points and destinations such that one, we have higher coverage of transit networks, uh, and two, we can scan ASs that are more relevant to uh, a transit network or a country of interest. Thank you all for listening, and now open to questions. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, please vote on a question. There are so many of them, so I want to prioritize. Uh, starting by um, another question from Ram. Uh, thank you so much. I think we should give you a word for just uh, asking questions right now. Um, how do you ensure your non Oh, um, uh, which one is for this paper? Um, which one is the la latest one? Um, so, sorry, I guess I can just ask the question. Um, so, do you know, your, if I understand your measurement design correctly, then you're using measurements to a remote endpoint 
uh, within Kazakhstan or, or one of the countries under study, right? Yeah, it's re measurement from outside of the country into okay. the countries. But, yeah. And do you know whether the same transit censorship also affects traffic from inside the country that's going to the destination that's possible uh, inside? We don't, um, but yeah, we, we don't. It's possible that kind of from the inside out, um, there are different different policies. Uh, but as has been found by kind of previous research that um, from countries neighboring Russia to um, servers where the traffic transits Russia, um, there's, they're still kind of experiencing, um, or there's reports of, of transit censorship. So it does seem like there does exist transit censorship in, in both directions. You could possibly use something like trace route mechanisms from inside the country to just look at the path and see whether it passes these transit ISPs. Awesome. Uh, Sadia is asking, can you use the TTL monitoring technique for censorship evasion? Um, you, in, in the form that uh, we used it for, I don't think so, since um, the sensor sits between um, the server and the, and the client, but uh, the TTL strategy is, is used for, for sending packets that um, a sensor might not process and, and throw away state. Um, and then you can send a subsequent kind of uncensored request that the, the sensor doesn't track. Um, another question, Ritika is asking, do you observe that all block pages are attributed to ASs? Um, did you see any generic block pages? We did not see any generic block pages. They were all, so. Actually, no, no. so five of the block pages were um, attributable to the ISP. Two of the block pages were attributable to Russia since they were from VAS experts. But for that, we had to rely on TTL limiting. Um, and because of the, the trace route difficulties, there could be some inaccuracy in exactly identifying those ISPs. But we do know that they are Russian ISPs that are responsible. Hi. Uh, thanks for the interesting work. Uh, especially the collateral damage, uh, but in my view, it's super challenging. So I'm just going to ask two important questions. Presently, most of the websites are shifting to CDNs, and CDNs bring the website directly into your own neighborhood. So are you sure that the website that you tried from the different vantage point, they were actually outside the country? And this relates uh, to the point that Ram was making that can we use trace routes to basically pinpoint? And then second question is, IP to AS assignment is a very tricky thing. Even presently, the measurement community is still trying to basically find out what are the robust ways to identify. And in this particular project that you did, this is very pertinent question because you may misclassify a particular router as belonging to a different AS and to a different country. Have you looked into these problems? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So for the second one first, uh, no, we haven't looked into um, kind of the, the AS identification problem yet. Um, we're kind of already aware that even our current results suffer from the potential of misclassification uh, for like general, general block pages um, since we have to use the TTL techniques and um, those that have limited accuracy. Um, the first question, I don't remember. CDNs. Oh, um, so in terms of like the like location of the, uh, could you clarify the destination IP addresses? Um, are they in the country? Um, so yeah, we, we use the IP allocations. So there's the possibility that um, in terms of like geographical accuracy, there's some error there. Uh, we did actually repeat from one vantage point using a geolocation database um, that also has an accuracy. So um, there, there are issues there. But uh, even with like a, a geolocation database for like IP addresses, we still observe uh, kind of the, the same level of uh, transit censorship. Um, in fact, kind of due to kind of hosting providers that own uh, ASs and kind of other countries, we actually see an additional couple um, instances of, I guess, transit censorship since um, we, would, we would classify kind of IP addresses being owned by an organization outside of Russia but located in Russia as um, kind of um, uh, being subject to, to collateral damage, I guess. Yes, I, I just like, I have two questions. First is, um, 
like uh, both of them are, are related to how do you how do you define transit censorship? Uh, one is uh, how do you do, do you consider cases where the same ISP could uh, operate in both Russia and one of the neighboring countries? I, like if I remember correctly, that there's a couple of them that operate both in Russia and right, Turkmenistan right. or like Kazakhstan. Uh, the other question is also like s similar question like do you consider regional uh, ISPs owned by Russian ISPs like Miranda in Ukraine? Like um, do you like differentiate these cases between uh, from general? transit censorship or, yeah. So um, several of the ASs presented are um, ISPs that operate in Crimea um, or like in, in Ukraine. Um, so in, in that case, the Russian internet service provider is kind of the direct upstream of, of the, the end user network. Um, but in that case, we still classify as transit censorship since those users in another country who maybe aren't you know expecting or consenting to that kind of um, traffic filtering are, are being impacted by censorship policies dictated by another nation. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, 